Pastor Tola Odutola, FCA, is the senior pastor of Jesus House Baltimore. He was a chartered accountant at Pete Marwick, KPMG, and at DHL as Treasury Controller and Business Development Manager before being called into full-time ministry. In addition to being the senior pastor at Jesus House Baltimore, Pastor Tola is the chairman of Alpha Leadership Conference, an organization charged with promoting and teaching leadership skills to all people of all nations. He consults, mentors, and coaches pastors, speaks regularly at leadership conferences, churches, corporations, ministers' conferences, seminars, and other leadership development opportunities. He is the author of I Am Better Than This and The Line Crossers. He has a passion to challenge people to pursue and maximize their God-given potential. Pastor Tola is happily married to Pastor Kofo Odutola and they're blessed with three lovely children. Ladies and gentlemen, make welcome Pastor Tola Odutola. Good evening, everyone. Uh, once again, I welcome you to GLC 2023. Uh, we thank God for all our speakers that have spoken earlier today, uh, Pastor Balaji, Pastor Sholafala Lade, and recently, uh, Dr. Ibukun Awoshika. Those sessions were highly impactful. And um, But tonight, I'm going to be talking about building resilience as a leader, building resilience as a leader. Um, it's important for us to understand that if we are going to succeed as leaders, we must be resilient. We must be resilient. So what does it mean? The word resilience, what does it mean? It is capable to withstand shock without permanent rupture. It is capable to withstand shock without permanent rupture. It is also to recover from or adjust to misfortune, loss, or change. Um, the past few years have taught us, many of us that life can be uncertain, that things happen in life that most times it just comes to you as a shock, and uh, most times you are not prepared for it. Um, the pandemic was one, you know, and um, because of this, so many things had, had to change. So many things had to happen to many organizations. Many organizations have had to shut down while many organizations are about to rethink or strategize themselves in order to be better than what they used to be. Uh, if we are going to survive you know, in our business world or as a leader, in, either in the church or in the secular, you have to be resilient. You have to be resilient. So tonight, I'm going to be looking at some characteristics of resilient leaders or people. Characteristics of resilient leaders or people. Number one, they are strong and courageous. They are strong and courageous. Many times people see leadership as intimidating. And therefore, we need strength and we need confidence. If your vision is not overwhelming, you probably need to check it again. And I'm, me, I'm saying that if your vision is not overwhelming you at the onset, you need to check again. Because most times, the vision God gives you is so large and so big that at times you are wondering, how are you going to do this? In the story of Joshua, when he took over after the death of Moses, that's in Joshua chapter 1 from verse 6 to 7, you know, God had to tell Joshua to be strong. Why? Because Joshua had witnessed many years of not entering the promised land, even of Moses. Joshua had witnessed the challenges that Moses had gone through with the people. Joshua is now being asked by God to lead the descendants of the same people. Note that all those people had died 40 years in the wilderness. And now Joshua had to lead their descendants into the promised land. So he needed strength. He needed encouragement. You know, you must be courageous if you are going to be resilient. because. Things will happen to you. Issues will happen around you that will make, as it were, your heart to shake. So you must be resilient. 
as a leader looking up for direction, confidence and encouragement was what Joshua needed. Because your body language, when you are in trouble or you are dealing with a challenge, tells people a story. The story is either you are afraid or you, you are confused and you don't know what to do. So you have to be careful how you handle tough times because sometimes we always come. You know, you don't only need strength, which is physical at times. You also need mental strength because most battles are fought in the mind. Most battles is fought in the mind. So for every believer, I'll now add this to it. You need spiritual strength. You need, number one, you need physical strength. Number two, you need mental strength. And number three, you need spiritual strength. You know, in Proverbs 24, 10, Moses, I mean, um, Solomon says something. He said, if you faint in the day of adversity, it means your strength is small. Your strength is small. So every change or disruption is targeted to destabilize us. I repeat that. Every change or loss or disruption in life is targeted to destabilize us. So without the strength, people fold up. They come to a conclusion that there is no way out. And I know that for every challenge you face in life, especially as a believer, there is always a way of escape for you. That's why the Bible said that in all situations we should give thanks because it's the will of God concerning you. So I want you to know that there is no trouble that has come concerning you that has not happened to anybody before. But if you go to God in the place of prayer, he's able to show you a way of escape. Number two, quickly. Resident leaders are always forward-looking. Resident, resilient leaders are always forward-looking. What do I mean by that? This is to look ahead at the next phase of things. Without looking forward or looking ahead, many have given up. Yes, I know COVID happened, but now we are over COVID as it were. You must look forward. No leader stays in the same place and becomes a visionary. No leader, I repeat, stays in the same place and becomes a, a, a visionary. You know, there was a time in the life of Abraham that things had gotten well for Lot, his nephew. And then the servants of Lot and that of Abraham started fighting. And the Bible said that Abraham went to Lot and said to Lot, why don't you choose you a place where you will go? And then I will choose another place and I will move on. And I was shocked that Lot <laughs> picked a place. Now, can you imagine the separation of Lot from Abraham, how it will have affected him emotionally? This could have been so depressing. There are times in our lives that we partner with people only for the people to disengage themselves from you. There are times you trust people that they will be with you for a long time only for them to come and say, um, the Lord is telling me to move or the Lord is saying this and that. You know, So those kind of things, because you have invested emotionally in them, you know, it can be quite depressing. If a partner you have been hanging around with for a while decides and say, it's time for me to move, what do you do? If an associate quits upon you, what do you do? You must look forward. Because the longer you keep on looking behind you, the more it's going to be difficult for you to arise from that position. It's good to cry. It's good to be emotional. But you can't be in the same spot for a long time. It weakens your spirit. In, in, the, in the story of Ziklag, when Ziklag was born down, and they overtook all the wives, all their children, and all their livestock and everything, the Bible says that there were 600 men there, but only 400 of them was ready when David came back and he said, let's go and pursue after these people so that we can overtake and recover all. Two were so weak. Why? Because they were not looking forward. They just thought what had been stolen from them has been stolen. There's nothing they can do about it. That is the end of their lives. I've realized that too many people, you sum up your life, not even in God's way. You just sum it up 
and you say, it's over for me. Who told you it is over? Yes, you've had a setback. It's understandable. People have setbacks. It's part of life. Even David himself that went to God, the Bible says that number one, he encouraged himself the Lord. And number two, David also had his wives and children taken away. But he did not allow that to put him in the same spot. He went after the people and he was able to recover all. I'm praying for somebody that God will allow you to go after what you have lost and you will recover all. You must adjust to what has happened and recalibrate. The past four years has taught us that there is not just one way of doing things. It has taught us that there is just not one way, especially if you look at church, of taking offering. It has taught us there is just not one way of ministering to people in church. Part of it is what we are doing now. For the past three years now, we've been doing this GLC virtually. It is part of the lessons that we learned. We, we took the heat and then we look forward and say, is there any other way that we can do this thing? And guess what? In the past three years, we have ministered to more people than we, we would have if we did it only you know, via um, on-site alone. And that's part of what has to happen. Every resilient leader must be thinking forward and looking forward, not looking backwards. Isaac, when he dug wells, the Bible says that every well that his father had dug before then, they had put some dirt in it and they have closed it up. And Isaac and his servants started digging wells. And each well they dug, the Bible said that they resisted him. But guess what? It did not stop him. He kept on digging. He kept on digging. He kept on digging. And after a while, it got to a real boat. I want you to know that whatever has happened to you in life that is not good news, you can move forward because that is not the end story of your life. And you have to understand that seven times the Bible says the righteous man can fall, but what? He also gets up. You must make sure that adversity does not define you or pin you down. You know, because if you keep on digging, you will find your real boat. Number three, resilient leaders are optimistic, always optimistic. What do I mean by that? They see the cup at half full and not half empty. Resilient leaders. They look at the total picture and not at an incident. I want you to know that things will happen in the course of the life of your business. But you must not see those things as if it's a final totality of the business. No. You can rise from a fall. When you see the cup half full, you are able to rise from any challenge faster than your contemporaries. What do I mean by that? There is always room for thanksgiving. You look back and you say, this case could have been worse. This case could have been worse, but look at what the Lord did. There are times that I've seen things that I thought I had lost things, but only for God to turn it around in my favor. Because every day for the resilient man is a good day. He wakes up every day and it's a day. He says, it's a day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in this day. Why? I believe every day is an opportunity for God to showcase his strength or his grace on my life. Look at Jacob. He served for seven years, 14 years, rather 20 years, you know, but for seven years for Leah. And then they gave him Rachel. You know, for Rachel, give him Leah. Then he served again under seven years. And eventually he married Rachel. But then after a while, they had cut a salary, deducted the salary 10 times. But one day, he said to himself, I need to go and start my own business. I need to go and start my own. So that I can, that is resilient leadership at work. If he was not resilient, I'm telling you, Laban would have taken him out. The only reason he kept on serving and moving was that he was hopeful that things will not be like this forever. He was hopeful. I've always believed that no matter the situation you find yourself in life, it is not permanent. I've always believed it. I've always believed it. There was a time in our lives, I'm talking about myself and my wife, that we came to America and things were not easy for us. 
when you just started. Things were tough. But over time, things started easing up. Over time, the things that we thought we could not afford, we were able to afford it. There was a time in this church that we could not even pay the salary, my salary. They could not even pay it. But over time, things started easing up. It was based on looking forward that we were able to survive this. Because I knew definitely, number one, that God has called us to do what we are doing. And I knew also that this would not last forever. It would not last forever. What, you, what happens when you see the cup out full is that it gives you the ability to hold on to your breakthrough comes. It gives you the grace to hold on to your breakthrough comes. That's why Job said, and that's one of my favorite scriptures, Job 14, 14. He said, if a man dies, shall he live again? He said, I always said, Building Jesus House Baltimore is not about me. It's about God and it's also about legacy. It's about God and it's also about legacy. What is the legacy? We are building in such a way that in future, 15, 20, 30 years, our children's children will point and say, look at the ministry that our fathers built. Look at the work that they did. Look at the sacrifices that they made. So this thing is more than taller to taller. And that's it. You have to be focused. Because many things will call for your attention these days. Many things will call for your attention these days. Today, I've had many missed calls. And one of the reasons why I couldn't pick up calls, you guessed right. Yes, we are doing GLC. So you can imagine me now picking all calls, settling marital problems, settling issues, and we are still doing GLC. How do you want me to do a good presentation at GLC tonight? You have to be focused. And this is where a lot of people miss it. They attend to every and all things. And there is not one thing that they are good at. You know, <laughs> David was about to be stoned when they attacked Ziklag. Every leader, you should be careful not to be bound by what people think or their reaction towards you. Mr. Wushika said the same thing. One of the greatest challenges of a lot of leaders and I'm going to be talking more about that, you know, in, in our church service on Sunday, is that people just care what people say about them, what they think about them. Honestly, I don't care. And that's the truth. Why? Because if I keep on caring about what 3,000 people think about me, I will be crazy by now. I'll be on medication. And Pastor Shalafal already said this, and in the same thing, I act and I do what I do to the audience of one person. It is God Almighty, the one who called me. Because at the end of the day, is the one that will judge. And say, this is what we told you to do. How come you didn't do it? Lack of focus. David encouraged himself and he went after those people. If you focus on what people say about you, you will not achieve anything as a leader in life. You will not. Because people have different opinions. People have different ideas. They have different ideas of who you should be as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, in their mind, they picture you that this is what a pastor should look like, talk like, walk like, act like. And this is what a pastor's wife should be, look like, talk like, act like. I said, no. I want to let you, you see, you have to understand what God has called you to do. No matter the business you are doing, if you believe very strongly that this is what God has given me to do, for now, focus on it. You will find fulfillment there. You will find prosperity there. You will find peace there because you are focused. Don't allow anybody to define you. Let your vision 
and the results define who you are. You must know the core value of your business. Mr. Ojika said that also. You have to, you see, when you know the core value of your business, of who you are, of what you have been asked to do, it's not that difficult for you to make a decision of what you want to do. No, it's not. It's not. I mean, it's like I'm repeating everything that she said. Because she was talking earlier today and she said, why would I want to sit at nine hours at a party in Lagos? And I'm sure that sounds familiar to any uh, JHB person. Why do I want to sit at 10 hours in your party for? Have I been called to do party? No, that's not what God called me for. So even if I show up and I leave at in one hour and you are taking offense, ah, <laughs> it's because you don't know what God has called me for. That one hour, it means a whole lot to me. And I'm talking about focus. Let me give you a practical example. Later tomorrow evening, I had called uh, a nephew of mine and said, I want to come to your house. I want to come and see you, your mom, you know, who's my sister, and da 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 da. And he said, Oh, they will be going out, but they'll probably come back home about six o'clock. I said, That's a bit too late for me. I said, But because of how important it is, uh, I will still come. He said, Uncle T, I understand. Sunday is your day, and this is Saturday. He told his mom, they also understood. They changed it and got back to me. They said, we'll be home at 3 o'clock. Why? Saturday night is not visitation night for me. I'm thinking about Sunday. That's my priority. I'm amazed that people go to parties and do so many things to distract them from the original call and the things that God has put in their hands. And you are now scantering around and running around on Monday morning trying to look for what is not lost. And I'm saying, what were you thinking? Why are you getting home at 3 a.m. when you know you have job? Office at 9 a.m. on Monday morning and 3 a.m. That's when you get home from Sunday night to Monday and you still want to perform at a very high level? Be focused. Jesus said that the lamp of the body is the eye. He said if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. Stay on point. Don't be a master of all trade. You know. Or jack of all trade and master of none. Improve and focus on your strength. And nobody will notice your weakness. You remember what she said also? Ms. Ojika said this in the last session. That she focuses on her own strength and that which is not her own strength, she will get people to be there. Focus on your strength. And then after a while, your weakness will not matter. Number five, I'm talking about resilient leadership. Characteristics of resilient leaders. Resilient leaders are flexible. They embrace change. They are flexible. When we look at the story of Abraham in Genesis 11, the scripture was talking about Abraham by faith, how he went out from a place and he was going to a place where he didn't know. And he was dwelling in tents <laughs> with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of the same promise with him. Why was he dwelling in tents? So that he would not have to have a permanent fixture. So if God says, get up again, boom, he gets up. Because the tent, he can dismantle it and he will get up. The elasticity of the rubber band makes it bigger than its original size. I repeat that. The elasticity of the rubber band makes it bigger than its original size. Flexibility enlarges your mind. Flexibility. It enlarges the organization. Flexibility enhances your marriage. I've seen people 
who, oh my goodness, who make a boast and say, what, when I put my mind on something, and they are talking about rigidity. I'm not talking about focus now. They are talking about rigidity. And I'm telling you, everybody is subject to change. It's only God that does not change. It's only God that does not change. In Isaiah 54, verse 2, it says, enlarge the place of your tent. Enlarge the place of your tent. Many times we have quoted that scripture that says, enlarge your tent. No, it says, enlarge the place of your tent. The place of your tent is where you put your tent upon. So no matter the, the size of your tent, if the place of your tent is not big enough, the tent cannot take it or accommodate it. And that place of your tent is your mind. Enlarge your mind. Enlarge your mind. Once we enlarge our minds, I'm telling you, there is nothing that you go through in life that you will not survive. Enlarge your mind. Enlarge your mind. There are many things happening right now in this generation that I don't understand. But honestly, I say to my children, if it brings success, then it's okay. Enlarge the place of your mind. Flexibility. There was a time I never thought it is possible to study without listening you know, to a radio or doing this is possible. But I realized that over time, I saw my children doing the thing. Over time now, even the TV might be on and I'm writing messages and I'm not distracted. And like the place of your mind. This mind is so powerful that whatever you give it room to do is what it does. If you put it in a narrow place, it stays narrow. If you enlarge it, it stays enlarged. I've been a victim of this many times. But I got to a point in life, I said, it will never happen to me again. What do I mean by that? When I think of something, the first thing that occurs to me is, how will I fund it? As a church pastor, the first thing that comes to my mind when we want to do any program, how are we going to fund it? But I've realized that it's a wrong way of thinking. The issue is not about funding. The issue is that, is it an instruction from God? And if God has ordained it, then he will find a way for it to be funded. Enlarge the place of your mind. Complex people complicate matters. I have a problem with people who are complex. You know, everything about them, you have to explain yourself. Oh, I didn't mean it like that. I didn't mean it like this. I'm going to say, please, please, please. I can't be explaining everything to you every day. I cannot be apologizing for everything I say. Complex is because some people are so touchy and they are so complex that everything you say, they take it personal. And I'm saying life is too short to be taking every statement personal for how long? I've realized that being simple makes things easier to retain patronage. Being simple. I've always believed that simplicity will answer to a lot of issues that people are dealing with today. Again, Ms. Aushika said that. She said that one thing she likes is that she's simple. She's simple. Some people have to... They, 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 they want people to know that they have arrived when they show up. When they show up. Simplicity. How many times have I said to a protocol in our church, I say, I can carry my iPad. Carry my iPad is the list of things I can do. I can carry my iPad. I carry it from my house. So why should you be carrying it for me when I come to church? But some people, oh, as soon as they walk in like this, there are three or four people carrying their bags. I'm saying, for what? For what? Simplicity. Our God is a simple God. And that's, you can imagine how God is working with us to let you know how simple he is. How simple he is that it's by grace that we have been saved. True faith is a gift. How simple our God is. Just believe in the Lord, confess your sins. He said, and then you are cleansed, cleansed, and that's it. 
And that's the reason why so many people don't even want to accept because they see it as too simple. You see, when you are complex, <laughs> it's difficult for people to be connected with you. They can see it and you are trying very hard to win people over to your side. But they can see that that thing that you are doing is not real, is not genuine. You are just doing it because of the position. Rigid people are always trying to make points. Every time they have to make a point. Every time they have to make a point. <laughs> you know, I've realized at times you, you can just keep quiet. That doesn't mean whether you, you, are, you are guilty or you are not guilty. Just, just have to keep quiet. Okay, oh, okay, I get it. That's all right. Let's move on. And I move on with life. But every time you are defending yourself, you have to be careful because the more you do a lot of that, the more you are pushing people away from you. Resilient leaders are flexible. If you are not flexible, you cannot adapt in the marketplace. You cannot adapt in the nation or the industry. Look at the flexibility of Amazon. It made them the market leader in all lines because they're flexible. There was a time that Walmart was not the leading uh, brick and butter, uh, mortar uh, um, business online. They were not the best. But I looked at their result the second quarter of this year. They beat everybody. Everybody, they beat their mass down. Why? Because they were flexible. They decided to make changes. How simple is your website to navigate? There are many businesses making millions of dollars, excuse me, without brick and mortar. <laughs> Things don't have to be difficult for you to work. I had an experience in London many years ago, <laughs> you know, and I will apologize to all our, you know, British uh, audience tonight. You know, I've always said that I don't know why the British say I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said, don't say you are sorry. Just solve the problem. Just, just say, I'm sorry. Now, when the British person says to you, I'm sorry, he wants to tell you a bad news. And it's not like he cannot or he or she cannot change that thing. But because most times they're not flexible. So what happened? I booked a hotel. Um, we're going to stay in London for about maybe four or five days uh, with a particular credit card. So when I got to London, I didn't have that credit card with me. But, so I wanted to change, exchange it with another credit card. So I gave them my passport and everything. And I said, oh, they say, oh, we have you booked under this credit card. I said, yeah. I said, please, can you take up that credit card? Let me use this credit card. And she said, I, I, I'm afraid. I can't. I, I said, why are you afraid? I said, just, just, just change. It. The next thing she said blew me out. She said, I will have to cancel your reservation. And then I will check if we have reservation again for you on, with a new card. I said, really? By this time, I was getting impatient. So I said, can I talk to your supervisor? They went around and they looked for the supervisor. Eventually, the supervisor came. So I just said, oh, yes, we have to do that, that, that. I said, the room is already booked. The room is available right now. So why would you want to cancel that room? I said, all you are doing is just to change the credit card, for God's sake. If I chose to pay in cash, and I say I'm not paying in cash again, I want to use debit card. Is that Why should that be a problem? I'm afraid. That's the first thing they will say to you in UK. Eventually, I think the second layer of authority came, and that one said, oh, they can, and they changed the thing. And I said, how can this be? And that's how it is when people are not flexible. The simpler you are, the more accessible you become. The more accessible your organization becomes. The more accessible your church becomes, the simpler you are. Number six. Number six. Two more points and then we'll, we'll round this up. Number six. Resilient leaders are always very creative. 
Brazilian leaders. They are creative. Creativity. This is to develop problem solving skills. If you are not creative and you get stuck, you will get stuck for, for a while. So you must be able to operate out of the box. What can we do to change the system? What can we do to make this train running and not stop? We will solve the problem later, but for now, what can we do in the interim? Creativity. There is nothing visionary or creative if we are doing things the same old way. This is the way it used to be. There are several ways things can be done. I realize that now without breaking rules. There are several ways. Several ways things can be done now without breaking rules. In the case of Gideon, when God called him to go to battle, you know, and what did Gideon do? 32,000 plus people came with Gideon and they wanted to battle with him. And God said, no, these people are too many. And this is what we're going to do. Ask whoever is scared amongst them, let them go home. 20,000 left immediately. The <laughs> remaining 10,000 they are about. And God said, okay, these are still too many. I want to look for creative people here. So what did God say? God said, take them to the water brook. Let's see how they will drink water. If they lap the thing like a dog is lapping, then we'll see that that one is the one that we should choose. And that's how they chose them. That's how they chose them. Creativity is the mother of invention. If you are not creative, you can't invent any new thing. If you are not creative, you can't, you can't start something new. You have to be creative. You have to look for ways that people are not thinking to do the same thing and to achieve even the same thing or better or better. As tough as things are now, I want you to know that creative people, churches, businesses, they are still growing. As tough as things are. If you are a church pastor and you are online and you are saying to yourself, my business or the church is not growing, or you are a businessman, you are saying my business is not growing, can you go and check how creative you have become? Or maybe you are stuck in the same old way. Because when you are creative, there is no way you will not grow. Because creativity brings growth. Creativity makes you to stand out from the park. People are tired of attending just churches every day. They want creative and impactful ministry. They want a ministry that will impact their lives and they will see a change. They want a business that will do something different and makes life so easy for them. Um, last week, we, we traveled out of the state. Uh, we went for a wedding. And um, we have said to ourselves, you know, that, hey, let's just relax where we are staying. You know, we decided not to stay in the hotel. And we said, let's relax. But if we want to eat, we eat out and all. So I said to my wife, while at the airport, while at the airport, I said, look for an African restaurant, preferably a Nigerian restaurant, order some food, and let them go and deliver in the house we are staying in. Creativity. She looked, she looked, she looked, she found one. She, you know, Uber eats, da 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 da, or is it dot dash, one of those two? Pum, 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 pum. They said they deliver in one hour. We reckon that in one hour we should be at that apartment, but we were not there in one hour. Guess what? The person that was delivering food had been there in one hour. And the person called us on phone and said, I'm here at your door and I'm knocking. We said, we are not there right now. Put the food in front of the door. Just leave it in front of the door. Oh boy, they left the food in front of the door. We got to the place, we found the food. We ate. Creativity. Before, you will have been going all over the place, looking for where to do this, looking for uh, in a city where you are not familiar with. But thank God, the people, even though they are selling African food, they have a website that you can go to. You are wondering why is your business not moving. You are not creative. You are not creative. You keep on praying. You keep on binding. You keep on anointing the place. But you are not doing anything creative. Nothing creative. Nobody's going to know where you are. 
You must be creative in order to be resilient and in order for you to survive shock. And finally, resilient people or leaders, they persevere and they are very intentional. Resilient people, they know how to persevere and they are very intentional. What does it mean to persevere? Perseverance is to hold on despite opposition and sometimes discouragement to hold on, despite opposition and discouragement. To be intentional is to do things by design or on purpose. It's to do things. It's almost impossible to be resilient without these two, which is perseverance and intentionality. I'm amazed that many times people are saying, oh, nobody's supporting me, nobody's supporting me. It's okay. It's okay. It, it's, your, it's your vision. It's your vision. Really, do you need a lot of people like that to support your vision? Let that vision begin to speak and you will see how many people will show up to support you. And that's it. You must persevere. Because if you shut down before people start to appreciate what you have to offer, then there's no story to tell. That's why they say where I come from, that if you're going to talk about the war, you must survive the war. You must survive the war. When things seem not to be working, what makes you to hold on is perseverance. It's perseverance. It's not for the weak at heart. And I said it earlier, that you have to be courageous and strong. It's for the strong. There is no vision without its challenges. You know, at times, there was a time uh, a pastor was discussing with me about the challenges he was facing uh, trying to build their church. And I was really, you know, trying to encourage him. I said, don't worry, it's going to come to pass. You know, at times, this things that he said, no, 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 you don't understand. Ah, pastor, T, when you built your own church, ah, you didn't go through this kind of challenge. I said, whoa, whoa, were you there? Which paper did you read it in the news? that I didn't go through challenges. The issue of life is that it's not everybody that carried their challenges on their faces. And then I started giving him some situations. They say, really? I said, yeah. In Charlotte right now, we have been paying rent in Charlotte, I think since February, this September. They just started renovation last month. And we have still not finished. And we are paying rent. Not only are we paying rent there, we are paying rent in the hotel that they are doing the church service as well. So what do you do? Do you award contract when you don't have a place of worship? So the place of worship will come for before you award the contract. And in awarding the contract, the county must give you approval. There are steps to go. There are people to pay. There are architects and everybody to talk to, artisans and all that to talk to before they all accept. And then you, you negotiate the, the, the bill and all that. It's perseverance. So somebody will not show up tomorrow and tell me, oh, the church in Charlotte. I say, you have no clue. You don't know how much money we are spent in that place. You have no clue. We are trying to build uh, a banquet hall now. Last year, we started uh, last year the approval process. We still don't have the approval process now. This is September. This is September 2023. We still don't have the approval. And then somebody will now come and say, oh, da 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 da. I said, no, it doesn't work like that. Because we were not crying over it, because we were not making face, because we were are not frowning. Does it mean that we are not going through challenge? We were. But, but we just made mind that we are going to persevere. So you too, you can persevere. When Nehemiah decided to build the wall, he persevered. He was intentional. He followed the deliberate pattern to get to his destination. People were telling him that, oh, don't worry, there's no way you can build a wall, that the wall will last and everything. Mm -mm. Nehemiah was not discouraged by any means, but he kept on moving. Challenges, I want you to know that they are part of life. 
refuse to abandon your goals because of challenges. Most challenges are temporary, and I've said that enough. Paul said to Timothy, he said, endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. The challenge of many people today aspiring for leadership is that they cannot take hardship. One small hardship, they say, I'm resigning. I'm leaving here. I'm leaving. I can't do it here. I'm resigning. I said, what is it that you have started now that you, you think you are doing something? What have you done really that you think is a big deal? You have just started. If every day you are resigning, every day you are resigning, at the end of the day, they will resign you yourself. You know, so you need to get up and say, this is part of life. It's part of life. He said, no one engage in warfare, entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that it may please him who enlisted him. Who has enlisted you in what you are doing? Who gave you the vision of what you are doing? Who made you the leader of where you are? So you need to understand that. And because of that, you don't carry out a threat every minute. And say, I'm leaving. I'm re After a while, they will call you out and say, you can leave. And there will be people that will take over and nothing will happen. Remember, God said, I have 7,000 prophets that have not bowed down to Baal. So there's a replacement for you, unfortunately. And there is for me too. So nobody can threaten anybody. If I threaten you as a pastor, God will say, don't worry, don't worry. You never thought you could do this work. I called you. I built you up. I will call somebody else. I will build them up. So you should not be too full of yourself. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation in which Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You must know how to keep on standing despite challenges to your vision. And finally, I want you to understand, I would rather be a visionary and go through life or than go through life without a vision. I would rather be a visionary than go through life without a vision. You can do this. God bless you. A lot of us have uh, gleaned a lot from this and are going to use it by God's grace. Well, we're going to go into a session of question and answers at this time, and uh, we have a few questions for you. I want to start out by, you know, quoting you something you said a few minutes ago. You said, refuse to abandon your goals because of hardship. And that would be a great segue into the question that someone has here. They said, how do you summon up the courage to start again when you have been betrayed by trusted employees or business partners. So this person you, you just have to, um, issues. Yeah, you just have to look for strength within you to say to yourself, yes, I've been disappointed by this employee or by that one, but I'm not going to give up. Why? Because why you are doing what you are doing should be your focus. Why am I in ministry. It's, you know, I've always believed one thing. <sighs> and this happened many, many years ago. Um, I was going through some challenges. And then one of my associates wanted to do something. And I said, no, 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 don't do that thing now. Just, you know, let's just finish with this and that. And I noticed he didn't like what I said. So I went back to God and said, what did I do wrong? And God said to him let, him, let him go and do what he wants to do. That he was not there when I called you. Let him go and do what he wants to do. I called the guy the next day. I said, go and do whatever you want to do. He, he freed me. At times, we overvalue people. You think that somebody will be with you for a long time, and then they are not with you for a long time, and you start thinking, but you look back, and you realize that even their living has elevated you. Mm. And that's the thing. You know, so, so honestly, I don't close my eyes just because somebody messed me up and they are passing by, because a good person might pass by and I will miss them as well. So you just learn to take it in strides 
And they, that's another strike. I'll keep on moving. I'll keep on moving. I'll keep on moving. And, and, and I believe that's, that's right about some of that question and also some of the things that you had talked about. Uh, so thank you very much for that answer, Pastor. Uh, there's another question someone has here, and they're asking, how do I, as a leader, encourage a culture of resilience and innovation within my organization? And I think this alludes to the fact that you talked about creativity. So this leader is asking, how can I encourage that culture of resilience? Maybe we made a decision and we had to bounce back from the effects of that decision and at the same time be creative. You know, how do we continue doing that or how do we do that as an organization? The organization has to determine from onset, what are our goals? What are our goals? When you look at Jesus House Baltimore, for instance, it is challenging people to maximize their potentials. So in everything we do, that should be the motivating factor. Do you understand? And there's something about leadership that people watch your body language if every news that is brought to you, you sigh, hmm, hey, hmm, then you are not worth being a leader. You are not worth being a leader. You, you see, at times they tell you things not because you don't know already. There are times people tell me things I already know. And I'm doing as if I don't even know anything about it. And the body language says a lot. Because when you slouch or you just do like, mm, I'm tired of this thing, then they get that from you and they turn it into an organizational culture that even their, our boss too is tired. So why can we not be tired too? We too, we are tired. Yeah. Do you understand? You know? So you, every leader has to understand that no matter the challenge, one of the major things you must do is to stabilize the ship. Stabilize the ship. Let people know that one of the reasons why I share a lot of personal stuff in church is that I want to demystify that thing that makes you look like a superhuman being. You know, and that's one of the challenges of pastors. We we'll dress up and we are doing as if we have no issues. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? You dress up as if as if everything is okay with you, as if you just fought your husband before coming to church and you are acting as if everything is okay. What's, what, what's wrong with us? Why can't we live a life that is simple and open? And just let people understand. Listen, there, there are things in my life that if I didn't share it, it would take God for you to know. But everybody wants to present themselves as if they were born with a silver spoon. Wow. And you were born with no spoon. Wow. So, so why don't you just look? This is who I am. I am here. I am what I am, like Paul said, by God's grace. That's when right. people see that in you, they know that this guy is a genuine person. When people see that in you also, how you have been able to maneuver around every major challenge and created a way. They know that they too have to try to maneuver to create a way out of the current jam and they become resilient. And, 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 and that's it. And that's it. it. It's important that we as leaders, we don't create a false impression of who we are not because we are trying to impress people. Wow. Wow. So being open sharing yeah. sharing your journey it yeah. does we don't have to be masked men and women no need for cover yeah. up authenticity yeah. is key thank you so much pastor that is yeah. that is awesome uh, you, you said something when you first started and one of the the the, the initial points you gave you talked about um, that most battles are fought in the mind it's a mind game, you said. If you can, if you can win the battle in your mind, then you, you've, you've done <laughs> the greater part of the work. And, and, and somebody is asking, how do you deal with the emotional toll that discouragement and disappointments have taken? 
how do you handle the emotional toll? It's affecting the mind of this leader. And they're saying, how can I, I want to get back up again, but right now I can't even summon up that strength and that humph to, to go again. It's because you've allowed it. It's because you've allowed it. The Bible says that whatever we allow here on earth shall be allowed in heaven. So mm. whatever we disallow here shall be disallowed in heaven. You see, when you hold on to emotional pains and hurts, it will pain you and it will hurt you. Mm. You have to get to a point that we start thinking like children. When two children fight right now, in the next two minutes, they are, they are playing again. That's right. It's because we allow it. We allow those things. We allow those things. Let me, let me give you an example, real life example. There was a lady, she used to be in this church and um, our former pastor passed, you know, and um, the former pastor was somebody, every, a lot of people knew the former pastor, you know, so I also knew the former pastor and I know that the lady used to be in the church of the, that, that pastor. So the pastor passed and uh, so after about six months to one year, I just noticed that she was getting melancholic, you know. And, and one day I, I, I met her in the corridor and, and I said, are you okay? I've been watching you for a while. This is not who you... And she said, the pain of my pastor passing is too much for me. I said, oh, the spouse of your pastor is about to get married. I said, get out of this nonsense, my friend. The spouse of the pastor is about to marry again. You are still crying here. Uh, I said, what is the problem now? And that is how some people do this thing. You cry more than they cry. believed. Wow. Because you have to say to yourself, yes, this thing has happened, but there is more to life. Hmm. And I've realized I've one realized. thing. Life does life. not wait for anybody it doesn't wait life is always moving uh mm -hmm. dr Ibukaushika said a whole lot about that that is if anybody dies today i'm telling you life moves on there will be mm -hmm. a church tomorrow if anybody dies today and that church will call service of songs wow there will be church a day after that church service is called burial service they call it home going or whatever name they want to call it it is still church service they are glorifying god there and they are going to bury the person so life is always moving on so i have to make a determination in my spirit so that i don't get into a state of perpetual depression that when people do those kind of things honestly i have to wipe it away and move on i have to wipe this thing and move on because there is more ahead of me than what I've just gone through. There is more ahead of me than what I've just gone through. Yes. I think if we can all remember that, it will serve us well, sincerely. I, I, some, sometimes, Pastor, though, it can seem bleak, you know. You just think that, whoa, that was a heavy blow. And but, but so this is encouraging to hear because of what is ahead of us. And I think you spoke to that also about focus. So if we... If, I love the last thing you said when, when you were trying to encourage us. You said, um, I'd rather be a visionary than have no vision. That is loaded, Pastor. I'd rather be a visionary than have no vision. Pastor, because I don't think you can that like that. Please share life, a bit more. Life light becomes on. more interesting hmm. when you have a vision. Life becomes more purposeful when you're a visionary. Yeah. Life becomes more entertaining when you're a visionary. You go to bed and you wake up early because you have a vision. Mm, there's something burning inside I, of you that you're yearning to I, achieve. I cannot tell you, but I woke up this morning at 1.30 a.m. And I was thinking about getting here for it yeah. is 1.30 a.m. I woke up. Vision I excites. have been in this place <laughs> wow. since 8.30. This is 8.30 right now, 12 hours wow. I've been here. 
I'd rather be a visionary than be without a vision. Wow. Because at least I know the 12 hours I've put in here, that you two have put in here, that many people have put in here, we are achieving the purpose. That's right. We are blessing people. That's we are right. going there adding to people. Yes. I could have spent the same 12 hours sitting down, playing Nintendo game, or going to a party, or doing Ooh. one thing or the other, or checking out Instagram page, or doing da 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 which I'm not saying that those things are wrong, but I'm saying I would rather use my time productively. Yeah. Productively, yeah, yeah. About I'll choices, rather. about choices. It's about choices. Thank you so much, Pastor. It's been 12 hours, so we just have to ask one more question before <laughs> uh, we close tonight. <laughs> yeah, and so we don't yeah. know you are, because we know you have a lot to give, sir. And, and, and there's still tomorrow, so we'll, we'll still learn a whole lot more. Uh, but the, the last question for this evening is this. What steps can I, as a leader, take to continuously learn and grow, even while facing obstacles? So this person is asking, and they're saying the obstacles are kind of maybe limiting, and, and they, they need to move forward. They want to grow, but the obstacles seem probably like it's looming so large that it's stifling them. Yeah. Number one, learn to talk to people. Mm. Learn to talk to people. There is nothing that you are going through or you have gone through that somebody has not gone through it before. So when you learn to talk to people, you will get encouragement from them. You get instructions, you get directions from them. That's number one. Number two, hang around people that are cheerful and forward looking. They understand, you know, uh, I don't do pity parties. I don't do that, you know. Um, if you complain too much, I get irritated because I'm saying, please, 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 please leave that one. It's part of the game. Why? Because if you don't like the heat, get out of the kitchen. Get out of the kitchen. So if you are in the kitchen, ah, there is heat in the kitchen, no? You understand? So it's part of it. It comes with it. So once you understand that and you get around people who, who will encourage you and who will challenge you to be better than who you are, then you are almost half on your way. And mm. that's the truth. You're almost half on your way. And, and, and finally, the same thing like I said before, don't dwell on hearts. Don't dwell on hearts. Look, I've been married for 33 years. Does it mean that me and my wife, we don't disagree? Does it mean that we have not hurt each other? If you dwell on hearts, the thing will not last. You just hmm. learn to move on. You just learn to move on. Yes, it's painful, but okay, that's all right. It's okay. You know, yeah, you'll get better next time. And then you move on. Because if you don't do that, I'm telling you, life becomes lonely. Wow. There's an African yeah. adage, very simple, that if you don't forget the disagreements of yesterday. After mm. a while, you will no longer have friends to play with. Mm. If you are canceling everybody, very soon you yourself will be canceled. <laughs> you know. So, wow. so, 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 what do you do? And at least for me, at this my age now in life, I can't afford to be lonely. Mm. So I can't be fighting everybody everywhere. I keep quiet a lot of times. It's not because I, I'm wrong or anything. I just say, you know what? I don't have energy for this. I just don't have energy for this. If you want to get a strike for, you know, for being right, it's okay. Get it. Let's, let me move on. Let me move on. Because there's more. There's more. There's always more. There's always more. If you have not had anything from me today, hear this. There's always more. We sleep tonight. We wake up tomorrow. There's more waiting for you tomorrow. Mm. So I don't want to die today because there is more tomorrow. Is the more. best is yet to come. Wow. There's more. Oh. There is more. Thank you so much, Pastor Tola. That's a great place to end day one of the Great Leadership Conference 2023.